nobody to, to, to um, physically scream at or someone put their arms around me, just listen. It's a tape of Princess Diana unlike any you've ever seen. And I said, what do I do? I'm coming to you, what do I do? And she said, I don't know what you should do. Told us hopeless. And that was it. That was help. For a woman so guarded, the conversation is strikingly honest. For a woman so polished, surprisingly informal. It's a remarkable videotape, hidden away for years and only now come to light. I was always told by my family that I was the thick one, that I was stupid and that my brother was the clever one. And I was always so conscious that I used to go to heaven and just cry and say, I wish I wasn't so stupid. Who was Diana talking to? And why did the normally private princess, who almost never granted interviews, sit down for such an intimate discussion? The story begins in 1992, the royal family's most troubled year. Despite the cheerful pictures in the news each week, the story of the royals was much more like a soap opera. 1992 is not a year on which I shall look back with undiluted pleasure. Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson had announced their separation in March. Princess Anne, the Queen's daughter, divorced in April. Then came the news that rocked Britain to the core. We do face a crisis in the House of Windsor. It's obvious to everyone. I was a bit shattered. It sounded too much like an eye for an eye for me. I think she's been badly treated. The palace have not faced up to this crisis, and crisis it is. An explosive book called Diana, Her True Story, published that June, made scandalous charges about the Prince and Princess of Wales. The book said Diana had tried to commit suicide several times, that she'd suffer from bulimia, and that Diana and Charles, both miserable in their marriage, had both turned to others for love. Clearly, the prince and princess were living unhappily ever after. A lot of the people working closely with, with Charles and Diana knew the truth about the, the state of the marriage. But I suppose we all hoped that things might get better. Patrick Jeffson worked as Diana's private secretary for six years. He says by 1992, Diana and Charles agreed their 11-year marriage was all but over. Although it was very sad that they found they couldn't work together anymore, there was a real sense of relief that at least the difficulties were now being publicly acknowledged. Uh, and a line could be drawn under, under that phase of the marriage. We didn't know what was going to come next, but it had to be better. The question was, what did all this mean for Diana's life? Though not yet divorced, she was really on her own now, with two young sons and only the grudging support of the royal family. The princess knew she had to figure out a new role for herself. She had fame, and she wanted to use it to speak out on important issues. But for all her many gifts, a silver tongue was not among them. For many, the tragic consequence of their addiction is that they have lost their jobs Diana, then often called Shy Di in the British tabloids, had the kind of public speaking style that could make members of the audience drift off to sleep, or maybe wish they could. We cannot afford to think of HIV and AIDS as someone else's problem. But there was someone listening to her, someone who would help change her life. I think it was a Friday evening, and I heard a little bit of a speech that Diana had given on the radio. And she was terrible. Peter Sedlin is a former actor who once appeared in British soaps and the movie A Bridge Too Far. Over the years, he developed a thriving business as a communications consultant and voice coach. In 1992, one of his clients happened to be Diana's personal trainer, Carol Ann Brown, and Sedlin says he told her the princess could use some help with public speaking. A week later, Diana asked to see him in Kensington Palace. As I went up the stairs to her private room, she came running down. Dum, 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 dum. Hello, Peter. It's this way. In their first meeting, Sedlin says Diana came across as a frightened woman, shell-shocked by a bad marriage and worse publicity. Sedlin told her giving good speeches could be a therapy of sorts and a way for a soon-to-be-divorced woman to show her husband and the world that she wasn't frightened and isolated, but strong and independent. You know, before she was tending to do speeches which were either documents written by somebody else, 
or, um, you know, I'm delighted to be here speeches. She was, you know, those ones made her into a bimbo. She didn't want to be a bimbo. She wanted to be treated as though she'd got a brain, and she had. Settlin told Diana she had to drop her regal mask and find the sparkle inside her. He said she could never give a good speech if she didn't know what she was passionate about. And he had a method to help her figure out what that was. After the first session, I said, look, I want to bring a camera. I want you to see you. Um, and we will do your story. You will tell me your story. And then you can watch. Because in a way, it does show you who you are. If somebody can draw you out and take you to the best of you, and you then see it, it reaffirms, yes, that is me. It's OK to be me. So on September 21st, 1992, with the media going mad over the state of the monarchy, the health of the Wales's marriage, and what the princes might be thinking, Diana plopped down on a couch in her Kensington Palace sitting room, with Settlin sitting across from her, and began telling him all about herself. I said, you can disbelieve me, but for God's sake, listen to me. This is one of at least 20 tapes Settlin says he recorded, using an amateur video camcorder, of the princess between September 1992 and December 1993. Most of the tapes show her practicing interviews and rehearsing speeches. It was only in the 1960s oh. that the World Health Organization yeah. <laughs> formally recognized alcohol, alcohol, oh, alcohol as a disease. But the first tape captured a casual, wide-ranging, and surprisingly frank discussion of her life. As it turns out, it is one of the very few interviews she ever recorded on videotape, and it may be the most natural. How did you convince a woman who had felt the lash of the worst of tabloid media to agree to speak about her most intimate personal trials on tape? Well, the tapes were for us. The tapes were always for us. She knew why we were doing it. She wanted to use this, her voice, uh, wanted to be heard. She needed to be heard. And uh, this was the beginning of the opportunity to do that. People have said mm. that the fact that you're releasing these tapes exploits Diana. I can't stop them saying it. I don't necessarily but agree. But do you think you exploit No, her? I don't. Not Because now. she didn't expect these tapes to be released. But she didn't know she was going to die. Um, she didn't know that, that people were going to write what they have about her um, and twist, twist the truth. I've had to shift to a place of it is better that the public see what she says, not embellished by other people, not people who, who, who make their living out of quoting what, uh, what she's done. I haven't done that. Settlin's tapes almost never saw the light of day missing for years, confiscated by police, and subject to a lawsuit by Diana's family, the tapes only recently returned to Settlin's possession. On the first day of autumn, 1992, Peter Settlin returned for his second visit to Kensington Palace, and he and Diana quickly got down to work. As if taking a cue from the change in seasons, Settlin suggested that if she focused on the changes within herself, she would find her true passion. If you were here, Dancer. Right. Towards the end, though. Very yes. Yeah, a bit Sorry, Han. <laughs> you're. Uh... <laughs> so you're, a you're just about to become an ex dancer. Now <laughs> yes. what are you going to do? Well, it would have been. It would have been an area with people communicating on some level. For an hour and twenty minutes, Settlin guided Diana through some of the most dramatic moments in her life, starting with the details of her childhood. Many of them were painful and would eerily foreshadow the life she would lead as an adult. She spoke, for example, of growing up in a home where she felt unwanted, desperate for affection. My parents, they never said they loved me. So you never knew that, eh? No, 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 no. There, was no there was always the kiss there, there was no hugs or anything like that. Diana, along with her younger brother and two older sisters, grew up at Althorpe, the family estate 70 miles north of London. It was a home filled with acrimony. Her parents fought often, and sometimes the tension went beyond bitter words. Diana was left with an emotional scar after one incident when she said she saw her father 
slap her mother. They were upstairs in a, a spare bedroom, you know, and the door was open. And I looked round it and I saw that. Um, when I tap on my sister for knowledge, my eldest sister, she had a grisly time because she was 16. Her parents' marriage, like her own many years later, would end in divorce. Diana's mother left her father for another man when Diana was only six. According to biographer Andrew Morton, it was then that Diana first learned how it felt to be let down by people she had hoped would love and guide her. For a time, she became an elective mute. That's to say, she would only speak on certain occasions. She was so traumatized by the event. For a while, Diana kept a lonely vigil, hoping her mother would return. My father told me about five years ago, he said you sat on the doorstep, you didn't eat, you didn't bath, you didn't sleep, you just sat back, just, you know, you just never spoke. What she was doing was taking me back to being a little girl, and she was just honestly saying what that little girl did and how that little girl coped with it. And in my terms, it gave me an insight into, you know, what she was about. In the years after her parents' divorce, Diana was often left in the care of others, first a series of nannies, then her teachers at boarding school. She felt detached, which is why she was thrown by a surprising development at home. Diana was 13 when her father married Countess Rain Dartmouth, a woman the Spencer children detested. Diana told Peter Sutherland that she and her siblings found out about the wedding in a most extraordinary way. Sarah rang me up. She said, have you seen the newspapers? I said, well, Daddy's married Ray. I said, oh my God, how did you know that? It's in the Express. The Spencer children were furious at their father, and they decided they wanted to confront him. But Diana alone would be the one to deliver the message. For once, she was going to stand up for herself. And what happened next seemed a critically significant moment to Peter Sutherland. You can actually see her move from that to becoming a powerful woman. Uh, not a girl, but a woman, uh, ready to take on almost anybody. Egged on by older sisters Jane and Sarah and younger brother Charles, Diana prepared to give her father a piece of their minds. I was so angry. But Sarah said, right, Dutch, my nickname was Dutch, you go in and sort him out. He said, I want to explain to you why um, I've got married to Ray. And I said, well, we don't like her. <laughs> and he said, I know that, but you'll grow to love her, as I have. And I said, well, we won't. I kept saying we, not I. So it's a little crusader here. And um, I got really angry. And I, if I remember rightly, I slapped him across the face. And I said, that's from all of us for hurting us, and walked out and slammed the door. He followed me, and he got me by my wrist, turned me around, and said, don't you ever talk to me like that again. And I said, well, don't you ever do that to us again, and walked off. Her world was shattered. It wasn't until her later teen years, reflected in these pictures from a book called Diana, the Portrait, that Diana began to achieve some stability in her life. It was then that she became convinced she was meant for something special. I knew that something profound was coming my way, and I was just um, treading water, waiting for it. I didn't know what it was, I didn't know where it was, I didn't know if it was coming next year or, or next month, but I knew I was different from my friends and where I was going. The ambition she always had was that she felt a sense of destiny. I think she had this profound sense, deep sense, of who she was and where she was going. And yet, Diana seemed conflicted about pursuing that destiny. While wanting something more from life, she also told Settlin that during her teen years, she had been content to be alone. And I used to be the one that sat at home, happily at home, sitting in front of a um, church and reading a bowl of cereal. That was my idea of this, because I put all the energy into my work. And I wasn't interested in men as such, albeit they were there were a few who were interested in me, but I, they got so far and then they were given the green light to push off, always. Then, in the fall of 1977, not long after she turned 16, Diana met Prince Charles, who was 29. He was actually dating Diana's older sister, Sarah, and it was Sarah who invited Charles to visit Althorpe, the Spencer estate, for a weekend party. I remember meeting him and feeling desperately sorry for him. A, that my sister was wrapped around his neck because she's quite um, 
travel thing. If she had her blinkers on, she'd get what she wanted. She wouldn't look out there, she'd just go back. That weekend, Sarah wanted to show Charles the impressive art gallery at Althorpe. And she said to me, do you know where the lights are? And I did know where the light switches were, they were hidden. So she was livid that I knew and she didn't. So Charles said to me, well, why didn't you take me up there? I was getting these looks from Sarah. <laughs> so I didn't care two hoots about who Charles was. I thought, you know, poor old thing. But I wasn't impressed with anything around him. Uh, and I turned the lights on and Sarah said, no, you can go. But Charles had taken notice of the teenage Diana, and his attraction to her would grow over time. As she told Peter Settlin that September afternoon, Charles's interest did wonders for her self-esteem. It was the fact that an older man uh, who was in a prominent position, like to me, wanted to have me around. A man, yes. Yes, a man was prepared yes. to talk to me rather yes. than a boy. Yes. Charles's relationship with Diana's sister never developed, and both he and Diana moved on, Diana to finishing school in Switzerland. Charles, two other women, in search of a future queen. It would be three years before Charles and Diana met again, this time at the estate of a mutual friend. The year was 1980, and Charles had just lost his great uncle and close friend, Lord Mountbatten. Oh, wrong word. Whereupon he leapt upon me, started mm. kissing me and everything. I thought, well, yeah, you know, you know, this is not what people do. And he was all over me for the rest of the year. He followed me around, every like a puppy. And, um, yeah, I was flattered, but I was very puzzled. Diana had been talking to Peter Settlin for less than an hour, and what began as a casual conversation had quickly become very personal. Diana seemed comfortable with Peter Settlin, comfortable enough to share that unexpected story about her courtship with Charles, and the details of her evolving relationship with the prince were about to get much more intimate. Diana had hoped in Charles she had found not only her prince, but the love she had so desperately craved since childhood. But in 1992, that dream was broken and beyond repair. When Diana spoke to Peter Settlin here in London about how she got to this point, she seemed to be struggling to understand why she had ignored the signs of trouble even before the wedding. That first fumbling encounter with Prince Charles might have discouraged another woman, but Diana decided to give him a chance and thus began a significant new chapter in her life. By 1980, when Diana was 19, she had fallen hard for the prince, even though she said he still had a lot to learn in the boyfriend department. He wasn't consistent with his courting abilities. He'd ring me out every day for a week, and then he wouldn't speak to me for three weeks. Very old. And I, and I accepted that. I thought, fine, well, he knows where I am, he wants me. And the thrill when he used to ring out was so immense and intense, drive the other three girls in my flat crazy. But. Um, by now, the press had gotten wind of the relationship, and Diana was being scrutinized as a potential royal bride. Looking back on it all 12 years later, Diana realized the attention didn't leave her much time to reflect on whether this relationship was right for her. It's like being sucked in, just people pushing, mm -hmm. and then people pulling, all in the same direction. So you're being what, pushed by family? Yeah, they? my family looked great, and so did my friends, and so did um, Charles's family. They liked me. They were very good to me <clears throat> when I was a guest. We used to change when I was a, a, a daughter and my positions changed. She was set on a course which a lot of other people thought would be lovely for her, and because she was quite naive, went ahead. But Abinipa was going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm not ready for this. In February 1981, Charles and Diana came out to announce their engagement to the world. Just delighted and unhappy. No one knew it at the time, but the first interview they gave as a couple was an ominous sign of things to come. I, I'm amazed that she's uh, 
being brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love? Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> I was brought up in the sense that, you know, when you got engaged with someone, you loved them. And the most extraordinary thing is we had this ghastly interview um, the day we were announced our engagement, and this ridiculous ITN man said, are you in love? So I thought, what a thick question. So I said, yes, of course we are, in the sort of fat, slow and ranger that I was. And Charles turned around and said, what in ever in love means? And that threw me completely. I thought, what a strange question. What a strange answer. response. God. To me. It's a pivotal movement. It shows that he's ambivalent about it. I think that in context, Prince Charles was not looking for love. He was looking for someone who can share the burdens and duties of a future princess and a possible future queen. So, in a way, love was not top of the agenda. As far as Diana was concerned, as a modern woman, it was. When did you ask him? No, Dad. You were me find it. I mean, you were in We met 13 times before we got married. <laughs> <laughs>The public adored Diana, and Diana adored her prince, not to mention the idea that marrying him was her great destiny. But even before she married, she was beginning to worry her destiny might be a curse. Certainly, she never pictured sharing Charles with another woman. Camilla Parker Bowles was the prince's longtime girlfriend, confidant, and hunting partner in the years before Diana arrived on the scene, and she didn't exactly make herself scarce once Diana and Charles were engaged. Just weeks before their wedding day, Diana overheard Charles talking to his ex on the telephone. She heard him on the telephone saying to uh, Camilla, whatever happens, I will always love you, and that's before he went off to Australia. We have the famous footage of her crying as he uh, uh, climbs aboard his plane. At the time, the press just figured Diana was sad to see him go. But in reality, she was wondering if she should call the whole thing off. Andrew Morton says just two days before the wedding, Diana asked her sisters if she should back out. And they said to her, you know, too late Dutch, your face is on the tea towels now, which is all the souvenir tea towels, you can't chicken out. And on the day she married, whilst the eyes of the world were upon Diana, she had eyes for one woman, one woman, woman alone, and that was Camilla Parker Bowles. And as she walked down the aisle with her father, Earl Spencer, she was looking out for Camilla, and she spotted her in the crowd. And she thought to herself, as she walked down to meet Prince Charles, I hope that relationship is now over and we can come, go on with our married life. Their married life did go on, at least in public the prince and his princess bride living happily ever after, traveling around the world, bearing two healthy baby boys. But behind the palace walls, it was quite a different story. Endless misunderstandings led to hurt feelings, constant arguments to cold shoulders. Diana and Charles never found their stride together. It's a classic case of psychological crossed wires because Diana couldn't give Charles what he wanted and Charles couldn't give Diana what she wanted. Five years into the marriage, Diana said she suspected her husband had gone back to Camilla Parker Bowles, and she confronted him about it. I was just saying to my husband, you know, why, why this lady around? And he said, well, I refuse to be with any Prince of Wales, I never had a mistress. In fact, Diana claimed Prince Philip had actually given his blessing to the affair on the eve of a royal wedding, as long as Charles gave marriage to Diana a sporting chance. My father-in-law said to my husband, uh, if your marriage doesn't work out, you can always get back to her after five years, which is exactly, I mean, f for real, I knew that it happened after five years. I knew something was happening before that. The princess was seething, frustrated, and trapped in a life she knew was a lie. She thought that he was seeing uh, Camilla, and she said to me, you know, jealousy, jealousy, rage, rage. I mean, she, she was just out of control. Even though Diana would soon take a lover of her own, her writing instructor, James Hewitt, she said she still wanted to force her husband to come back to her. So she decided to go straight to the top and appeal to the queen herself, her mother-in-law. By 1985, Charles and Diana's four-year-old marriage was deeply troubled, but the public was still none the wiser. 
The British people were enthralled with their glamorous princess, now 24, and the two royal heirs, William, age three, and newborn Harry. That year, a British TV documentary called The Prince and the Princess of Wales, talking personally, portrayed Diana as the doting wife. What do you feel your role is? What is your contribution? I feel my role is supporting my husband. It's extraordinary to rerun the events of those years uh, with the knowledge that we now have. In truth, behind the scenes, the marriage was practically dead. They've been together only three days in the past five weeks. As Diana described the extent of the tension to Peter Settle and her voice coach, she recalled that things between her and Charles were awkward in every way. There's virtually no sexual relation between Charles and Well, there was. There was. There was. So, but it was odd. Very odd. But it was, it was there. And then it fizzled out about seven years ago. Six years ago. Right. Seven, eight. How do you know it was odd? Instinct told me. It's just so odd. I just, I don't know. There was no requirement for it from his case. Sort of once every three weeks I look about it and I kept thinking. And then I followed a pattern. He used to see his lady once every three weeks before we got married. Consider how extraordinary this conversation is. This was only the second time Diana had ever met Peter Settlin. And here they are, Her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales and a former actor sharing secrets of the royal bedroom on camera. She talks about some very personal things. Well, as we now know, she'd already, she'd, she'd done it with, um, for, for the Andrew Morton book uh, on one level. In a sense, maybe that, that, doing that, had helped her understand who she was. I mean, any, any, whether it's therapy or talking to your best friend about what you're, what's really upsetting you, you feel better afterwards. Princess Diana herself was the principal source for that explosive 1992 book by Andrew Morton. It was part of her strategy to reshape the public's opinion of her and her life. But the princess never meant these tapes to become public, and Sedlin has been intensely criticized for deciding to release them. I don't want to denigrate uh, Diana. I'm trying to give the public an opportunity, finally, finally, okay, 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 you, you see for yourself. Because these people are spoiling, not just the work that I did with her, but using it again to kind of diminish her. And I don't think that's right. Why would she agree to be taped talking about her deepest secrets to Peter Settlin, a man she barely knew? Because Diana lacked a happy and secure domestic base, um, it seemed to me that, that she very often wasn't very discriminating. Uh, in who she confided in. Patrick Jeffson should know. He was Diana's private secretary for six years. He has published a book about her called Portraits of a Princess. She needed to speak. She needed to be heard. He was there. But she allowed him to videotape her. That's the difference. She was under a great deal of stress. And like anybody under stress, she wanted to unload. And uh, there weren't that many people she could unload on. The princess was about to be even more indiscreet, offhandedly revealing the story of a private showdown she'd had with the queen over Camilla Parker Bowles, the woman Diana thought had stolen her husband. She felt that there was a basic conspiracy inside the royal family, amongst friends, courtiers, um, bodyguards, valets, to, to deceive her about the presence of Camilla in her life. So it was a canker that ate away at her. By 1985, Diana told Sutherland she had had enough. I went to the top lady. The top lady, otherwise known as Her Majesty. It was a bold move. According to Morton, Diana was in awe of her mother-in-law and terrified of her as well. The Queen always had tremendous amount of authority and power in, in Diana's life, and Diana made an effort to understand her, but never could. She always used to say to me that, that she found her kind of baffling, this kind of stoical um, uh, way that she just behaved. And, and the style of Diana was very, very different to the style of the Queen. But if Diana had hoped to get support from the Queen, she was sorely disappointed. According to the Princess, the Queen turned a cold shoulder to her appeal for help. The Princess described an emotional scene inside the walls of Buckingham Palace. 
and I was sobbing and I said, what do I do? I'm coming to you, what do I do? And she said, I don't know what you should do. John was hopeless. And that was it. That was help. So I didn't go back to her again for help mm. because uh, I don't go back again if I don't get it the first time. I and so over the years, Diana never talks to me. I never know what's going on. Silly girl. Diana said she went to the Queen and asked for help in her marriage, and she didn't get any. When Diana said that she didn't get any help from the Queen, I think we have to treat that with a pinch of salt. The way in which perhaps the senior members of the royal family tried to advise her was one which she found quite difficult to work with. Why? You know, there was a generational difference. Uh, there was a difference of attitude, and for a lot of the time, there wasn't enough common ground. Diana was angry. Uh, she felt... Uh, isolated and let down. There's just nobody to, to, to uh, physically scream at or someone put their arms around me, just listen. I don't, I, when I cry, I can't bear anybody to say, it can't be as bad as that, or um, we understand. Nobody understands the mystery of the individual concerns. It had begun as a casual conversation between a speech coach and his student. By now, Diana's interview with Peter Sedlin had become an extraordinary window into the private life of one of the world's most intriguing women. It's interesting to watch her face. It's as if, mm. watching her face, mm. one could surmise that she is relishing, enjoying, maybe needing this attention, needing to talk about these sure, stories. Well, the thing is, we got on, and you know, we talked, and she would twinkle, and I was twinkling. I mean, she had a fantastic smile. So if she smiled, I would smile, she'd smile back. And so you get to a place which is, you're having a nice time. The revelations came one I traumatized me. after another. So I took it out on myself. From a woman looking She's back on some of the that. worst years of her life. Each time I was locked down, I came back up again. To a man she hardly knew. Why did she do it? Were these the outbursts of a frustrated and reckless woman pushed past the point of caring? Or, after so many years of emotional isolation, was Diana just relieved to have a sympathetic ear? Or maybe this. Was she so happy that she had finally broken free of a royal prison that she couldn't help talking about it? But I do feel, Peter, that I won the their own game. Now. Now? But you've had taken no, no. 11 years of your life. Your life. Princess Diana had started this exercise with Peter Sedlin to find her true voice. That wouldn't be easy because by now she'd spent years acting like someone else. Deep in despair, isolated and alone in Kensington Palace, Diana still continued to play out the royal fairy tale. As she continued her story, Sedlin realized how much the double life she'd been leading had helped to bury the person she really was. When it comes to a drama, I can only sort myself out. I can't get anybody else to sort me out. How the parade she marched in public, with hospital visits, gallery openings, and grand foreign tours, was bitterly resented in private. And I think that was what many people found very difficult to appreciate about Diana. She was always smiling, but beneath that, there's an awful lot of despair. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but it can also tell a thousand lies. So you're on isolation, and uh, anything anyone says, she wasn't just unhappy, Diana was also ill with a severe eating disorder. Bad as that was, Diana said the royal family added insult to injury by blaming her troubles with Charles on the bulimia and not the other way around. And they all blamed the failure of the marriage on the bulimia, and that's taken some time to get them to think differently. I said I was rejected, I didn't think I was good enough for this family, so I took it out on myself. I said I could have gone to alcohol, which would have been obvious. I could have been anorexic, which would have been more obvious. I decided to do a more discreet thing, which ultimately wasn't discreet, but um, I chose to hurt myself instead of hurting all of you. She was right that it wasn't discreet anymore. In 1986, Diana fainted at a public appearance in Canada. The one thing was, when I was bulimic, I wasn't angry because um, the anger, I thought, was coming out that way. And it always felt better after I'd been sick to get rid of the anger. I'd be very passive afterwards, very quiet. Actually, the anger was coming out another way, too. By the early 1990s, Diana and Charles were visibly distant, even irritated with one another. They continued to play their royal parts, but it was painfully obvious they were just acting, and not very well at that. 
it was becoming quite obvious to, to us who were working for them that it was becoming impossible to project them as a harmonious couple. Diana had finally taken steps to change things. By 1992, it had become clear to her, to Charles, and to everyone else in the royal family that the two of them needed to live separate lives. Now, working with Peter Sedlin, she was ready to take the next step, to leave behind her glassy royal image and let the real Diana shine through. Well, Jenny, I'm only trying to highlight a problem that's going on all around the world. Not just to visit sick children, but to demand the world pay attention to them. I met children who had suffered the most horrendous injuries. Not just to record her good looks, but to listen to what she had to say. The essential thing is not to have won, but to have fought well. Her conversation with Sedlin, confronting the psychological scars from her childhood and unresolved issues from her loveless marriage, would mark the beginning of a profound transformation. You see a woman under extraordinary pressure, and despite that pressure, there's an inner strength and an inner power that she, she was focusing. We were beginning to focus her power, and she was finding her voice. She was finding her voice as to why she was here and what she was here to do, and it wasn't within the royal family. What started as a session to enhance her abilities as a public speaker would help Diana cast a new role for herself. Until now, she'd been famous, yet still somehow unknown. That was about to change. Minds cast a constant shadow over so much of this work. With Peter Sedlin's help, Diana was about to introduce the world to her true self and evolve into royalty's first independent modern woman one of the most admired, influential, and best loved icons of our time. Since 2001, when the existence of the secret videotapes of Princess Diana first became known, there has been a frenzy of speculation about what might be on the recordings. So when the tapes were broadcast by NBC News, they made headlines around the world and became the lead story on London TV channels. Previously unseen footage of Princess Diana has at last been broadcast on television. Tapes that now offer the most honest self-expression of her troubled life to date. Talking about her troubled relations with the royal family from the time of her very first encounters with Charles. Whereupon he leapt upon me, mm. kissing me and everything. I thought, well, yeah, you know, you know, this is not what people do. The tapes are almost certain to remain in the headlines, thanks to the new disclosures revealing details from her childhood and a startling admission that just four years into her marriage to Prince Charles, Diana fell in love with another man, a man she referred to as the greatest friend she ever had. I just, you know, all my heart and my sleep was only happy when he was around and the rest of it. Diana made that and other disclosures to Peter Sedlin, an actor turned voice coach, who had volunteered to help the princess become a better public speaker. To get her comfortable, Sedlin asked Diana to sit before his video camera and tell him her life story. My parents, I never said they loved me. Much of the early discussion during the hour and 20 minute interview centered on a defining moment the day her mother left her father for another man, when Diana was only six. It was the beginning of a bitter divorce and custody battle between her parents. And you really didn't see your mother again until she came back married? Well, she, no, she had to go away. The court said, if I'm right, she had to go away. She's gone, father didn't say where. No. She's just gone. Diana was devastated after her mother left. Her feelings of abandonment only intensified when, after her two older sisters went off to boarding school, her father hired a series of nannies to attend to Diana and her younger brother Charles. Diana wanted nothing to do with them. Did you just tantrum with them? I made life very difficult for them. In what way? I suspect, well, I suspect what I was jealous of, the fact that they were going to be busy with my making eyes at my father, and actually we wanted his attention, I think. Looking back, that was what I was of. I, we used to put um, pins underneath her cushion of her chest, and when she sat down, she sat on a pin cushion. 
Um, we hid her clothes. One of them got engaged to someone, and then I chucked her ring down the drain. I mean, it was really um, nasty, spite so. I was surprised. What, that she talked about it, or...? That she revealed so much of her anger about it. Putting pin cushions in the chair. But what she was doing was taking me back to being a little girl, and she was just honestly saying what that little girl did and how that little girl coped with it. And, in my terms, it gave me an insight into, you know, what she was about. According to Andrew Morton, Diana's biographer, her relationships with men later in life would be profoundly affected by her relationship with her father. Diana thought that the nannies were throwing their caps at uh, her father, Earl Spencer, and that one of them would try and woo him away from her, uh, you know, because Diana felt a very mothering role towards her father because of, she could see the hurt he felt by the, uh, the, this catastrophic divorce. Her parents' breakup left young Diana desperate for love and affection. Her pain only deepened when her father placed her in a boarding school when she was nine. And when he left, kissed me goodbye, that day I said to him, if you leave me now, you don't love me. She's a crippler, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But I meant it. While at school, Diana said she struggled to overcome self-doubts created by family members who repeatedly told her she wasn't bright. I was always told by my family that I was the thick one, that I was stupid and that my brother was the clever one. And I was always so conscious of that. I used to go to heaven just crying, saying I wish I wasn't so stupid and thick. I wish my family thought a bit more of me. I remember doing that a lot. That sense of inferiority was reflected in the results of her national high school exams. What did you take? Yeah, English language, English literature, geography, art, history, I think that was it. Oh, biology. Biology. They took five and got five. Well, we got D's, yes. According to Andrew Morton, feelings of inadequacy would trouble Diana for the rest of her life. She was a very bright girl, but it wasn't until towards the end of her life that she became more comfortable speaking to intellectuals. She always felt very intimidated by meeting intelligent people. When he asked me the question... As the conversation with Settlin continued, it veered from one subject to the next. Each new topic offered a potential insight. One minute they talked about the latest book on her nightstand. It's called How to Heal. The next minute, how it was her sister Sarah who was supposed to win Prince Charles's heart. My husband was supposed to be her boyfriend. Supposed to be, but you don't know. No. No, 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 they never slept together. Right. That's what she found so odd. My sister saying that. <laughs> yeah, right. It was in the midst of her discussion about her own relationship with Charles that Diana turned the conversation in a surprising direction. She brought up a subject which, at the time of the interview, hadn't even been whispered about outside the palace. Diana confessed that four years after she married Prince Charles, she fell head over heels in love with a married man. An encounter that had a tragic ending. 28 minutes into this first interview session with Peter Settlin in the fall of 1992, Diana took the conversation in a new direction. The topic was breathtaking when you consider Diana was both a married woman and a princess speaking indiscreetly inside her palace walls. I tell you one of the biggest crutches in my life, which I, I don't find it easy to discuss, was when I was 24, 25, I felt deeply in love with somebody who worked in this environment. And he was the greatest friend I've ever had. She was quite honest, it seemed, with you about her feelings for someone who worked inside the palace. Yeah. She needed somebody who would, who would let her be herself, who would look out for her. Diana didn't tell Settlin the man's name, but she was talking about her bodyguard, Barry Manneke. In 1985, seven years before she sat down with Peter Settlin, her four-year marriage to Prince Charles had all but broken down. She suspected her husband was secretly seeing Camilla Parker Bowles, and Diana, then 24, had begun to show interest in the 38-year-old Manneke. I was wandering around trying to see him. Um, I just, you know, wore my heart on my sleeve. I was only happy when he was around. And then... So you had any, any interest? Yeah. 
which you weren't getting. Settlin asked Diana whether she thought of the bodyguard as a kind of father figure. Yeah, I suppose you could say I did, yes. I'm sure I did. I was like a little girl in front of him the whole time. Desperate for praise. Desperate. Diana confided to Settlin that as she became closer to Manakee, she even half joked about running away with him. I mean, I was quite happy to give all this up. Well, I had all this. At the moment, at the time, it's quite something to have all this. Um, just to go off and live with everyone. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> well, one can. It's and he not... kept saying he thought it was a good idea too. So. <laughs> Were these idle fantasies or signs of much deeper, more intense feelings that then became physical? The same with the they have an exception. No. There was not a romantic relationship? There may or may not have been, but that's not what she said. And in many ways, I don't need to know. It wasn't the most interesting thing about her, her sex life, I'm afraid. Whatever the nature of Diana's relationship with Barry Manneke, newspapers have reported it was a full-blown love affair, though Manneke's wife says there is no proof, gossip about the Princess of Wales and her bodyguard spread through the royal household like wildfire. They all got so difficult, and people got so jealous and bitchy in this house, and eventually he had to go. And um, he was, it was all found out, and he was chucked out. It wasn't clear to Diana what her husband knew about her relationship with her bodyguard. But after Manneke was moved from protecting Diana and dismissed from royal service a few months later, Diana got the shock of her life. While she was riding in a limousine with Charles on the way to a premiere at the 1987 Cannes Film Festival, he turned to her to tell her about an incident the previous night involving Barry Manneke. Charles was casual, but to Diana, the news was an unbelievable bombshell. And Charles said to me she was killed in a motorbike accident, and that was the biggest blow in my life, I must say. That was a real killer. Diana said revealing the news in such a casual way on such a formal occasion was a particularly cruel and callous move by her husband. And Charles thought he knew, but he never, never, never had any proof. And he just jumped it on me like that. And I wasn't able to do anything. Crushed as she was, Diana still had to put on her happy royal face for the cameras at Cannes. I just sat there all day going through this huge, high-profile visit to Cannes. Thousands of press. Just devastated. Just devastated. You know, I wasn't supposed to mind as much as I did, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but then when I got out of the car, you know. It showed nothing. On that night in question, when you look at the pictures of Diana at Cannes, she looked as though she didn't have a care in the world. She was radiant, she was all smiles, and this, I think, is one of those central moments in Diana's life. She finds out that the man that she's infatuated with at that time is di uh, has died, and yet she's over able to project this, this fairy tale image of the, the glamorous princess. Diana said her devastating emotional pain over the loss was soon followed by suspicion. And then she said something even more extraordinary. I think he was bumped off. But um, there we are, I don't, I'll never know. She did say something that you didn't follow up on, and mm. I'm wondering why you didn't. Mm. She said that she thought that Barry Manneke was bumped off. Mm -hmm. I didn't get the, the feeling that she fundamentally believed that he'd, he'd been um, bumped off. She had a doubt. She wished that people would talk about it. It was more about somebody close to her being taken away. But Diana apparently couldn't shake off the nagging doubt, even though she'd already been told her suspicion was probably unfounded. The year before she sat down with Peter Settlin, Diana had asked Andrew Morton to investigate Manneke's death. She always felt that some unseen forces had engineered that death. As it happened, a journalist friend of Morton's had reported on the accident and had been at the scene. And he was able to confirm that it was an accident. A relatively inexperienced driver just passed their driving test uh, who had made a mistake and that Manneke had been killed in this very tragic accident. And I told Diana that. And whilst the logic of it was there and whilst the evidence was there, um, she never really believed that. Whatever happened to him, it was clear from Diana's interview with Peter Sedlin that Manneke haunted her long after his death.
she even went to clairvoyance to try to contact his spirit. I used to have really disturbing dreams about him. He was very unhappy uh, wherever he's gone to. And so I went and laid some, I went and found out where he's buried and went to put some um, flowers on his grave. Arriving at the cemetery, Diana discovered she was in the right place, but there was no tombstone. Manakee's body had been cremated there, his ashes scattered. It just chucked over the ground. That was absolutely poor me, but there I was in the position to do anything about it. So she laid the flowers anyway. And the day I did that, the day the dream stopped. It's so strange, wasn't it? It's like a sort of recognition. Diana's relationship with her bodyguard may have awakened new emotional depths within her, but it also taught her a harsh lesson. I should never have paid a fine, I did, and I got very burned. But getting burned may also have made her tougher. As the conversation continued, she was about to reveal how tough she really was. The 1987 death of Diana's bodyguard, whom she loved so deeply, left her feeling vulnerable and exposed. I was like the girl in front of her hometown. Desperate for praise. Desperate. And the comfort wouldn't come from her husband, Prince Charles, who had all but deserted her for Camilla Parker Bowles. Now, six years into their marriage, Diana yearned for intimacy. She found companionship with various lovers. And of course, she had the two boys she cherished. Still, she felt more alone than ever in her empty and sterile palace home. As Peter Settlin saw it, the emptiness she felt echoed the loneliest moments of her childhood. It was just grim, really grim. It was difficult. The more she spoke, the more Settlin sensed her fear of abandonment and her desperate need for her father's love. Settlin told Diana that confronting her past was the first step toward becoming a self-assured and independent woman. You know, this gap between a child and an adult is tiny. We all pretend it's huge, it's tiny. As she took him through her teenage years, Diana became particularly animated when talking about Countess Rain Spencer, the stepmother she despised, the woman she thought stole her precious father away. We all used to have like homing pigeons to him, to house and everything else. Yeah. She moved in, exactly. After Rain moved in, Diana's older sisters moved away, leaving 13-year-old Diana and her younger brother Charles to deal with attention alone on their weekends home from boarding school. So you kind of were entrapped? Yeah, we were. And I kept thinking, I kept saying to Charles, when we were 16 and when we were 18, we'd be on our own lives. That's all I could think about, our own choices. The wicked stepmother, as she became known, was nicknamed by her stepchildren acid rain. And rain further antagonized Diana, her brother, and sisters by taking control of the Spencer family estate. Diana biographer Andrew Morton. There was a huge transformation at Althorp House. Uh, many possessions were sold off, much to the anger of Charles Spencer and Diana, who felt that uh, she was selling off the Spencer heritage built up over a number of centuries. And she was selling silverware, paintings, and other uh, objets d'art at knock-down prices, just to raise money. She was a bully and just didn't know how to treat individuals. Open warfare raged between the Spencer children and Rain, with Earl Spencer caught in the middle. In 1978, he suffered a stroke. They say, the experts, they say the stroke was brought on by the tension between the four children and the stepmother, which is very true, I'm sure. At the hospital, Diana says Rain guarded him fiercely through his recuperation, even from his own children. Ten more years of animosity followed, and finally Diana was ready for a showdown. It took place in 1989, on the weekend of her brother Charles's wedding, an event attended by Diana's father, her stepmother, and her estranged mother, Frances. And my father and stepmother refused to even say hello to my mother. And it got me so angry, the behavior of these grown-ups, that I plowed in and screamed at both my stepmother and my father. It was very bad manners, they were just indulging in themselves. And this was Charles's day, Victoria's. Do we have to live in the past every time when we walk through the house? Knowing her mother was deeply hurt, Diana decided to finally unleash the anger she'd held in check since her teenage years. 
Diana, the Princess of Wales, on deck to be Queen of England, one of the most elegant women in the world, was actually about to get physical. And my stepmother and I ended up having this row, and I pushed her down the stairs, which gave me enormous satisfaction. My father didn't speak to me for six months. I had to go back and say, you know, I love you, darling, etc., etc. So it was all very difficult that way. But the arguments with Rain raged on. I was so angry, I wanted to drop on my stepmother of mine, because she brought such grief. And she kept saying to me, oh, but Diana, you're so unhappy in your own marriage. You're just jealous that daddy's in my relationship. And jealousy was not high on the agenda. It's behavior I was after. She said, you don't know how much we've suffered because of Francis. I said, suffering, Rain, you don't know the word. I see suffering of such magnitude in my role that you would never really understand. I really spat it out of them. Now, how did you spit it out? That, I mean, I just, I said, we've always hated you. You've ruined our family life. You've done a great job there, Ray. Right? Great job. Made us really unhappy. I hope you're pleased about that. That sense spilled over uh, after Earl Spencer died in uh, 1992. Uh, she, Diana and Charles Spencer were instrumental in just throwing uh, Rain's clothes out of Althorpe, taking them out of the back of Althorpe in, in plastic bin bags. She just, uh, you're very dismissive of Diana, you're so thick. She kept saying, you're so cynical. You no, know, but I've got a lot of other things you, you've never found out. You're real one Diana did more than unburden herself she gave Sadlund glimpses of her real strength. He knew she could use it to make a powerful statement on stage and in life. The princess realized her strength too, so much so that she made a surprising decision just months after talking with Sadlund. After all the years of turmoil, she decided to extend an olive branch to Rain Spencer. They had this very emotional lunch at Kensington Palace where Diana said, I, I want to thank you for looking after Daddy, that's to say Earl Spencer and they embraced and Diana cried and there developed over, the, over time a very close friendship uh, between Rain Spencer and Diana. The conversation between Diana and Peter Sedlin had been extremely productive. Now it was time to get to work. Diana was ready to transform herself from retiring royal spouse to formidable public figure. Eleven years after her marriage, Princess Diana was determined to recreate herself. These speech lessons and her intense reflection on her difficult past were guiding her toward the breakthrough that would help her speak to the world. When she was finally able to do that, she didn't just change her image, she changed history. In that first conversation in the fall of 1992, Peter Sedlin had been drawing Diana out listening as she narrated her own life story, the people and events that she thought had led to the edge of a precipice. Now it was up to Sedlin to help Diana create a new version of herself, the princess as mover and shaker, a well-spoken independent woman using her fame to change the world. She really, really wanted to deliver speeches better. I mean, it really mattered to her, especially at the beginning. But Sedlin had his work cut out for him, as these early practice tapes show. Attempts to understand yes. the origins of addiction. Yes. In Keep way. going. Now really Diana rich. gave about one speech a month, and Sedlin noticed she often had trouble getting her tongue around the yeah. words. Before we recognize alcohol, alcohol, oh, God, there's a disease. There is an insidious fear. Insidious fear, yes. Insidious fear. Insidious. Insidious fear. The key, Sedlin kept telling her, was simply to be herself, the one they had discovered together. Talk to them, he said, like you talk to me. He urged her to channel the same kind of fury she used to confront her stepmother years before. A key question. What? A key Come on, question. get angry with me. He'd seen the playful Diana that had charmed millions. Sorry, Okay. Is that thing on? Hello. Because suddenly. <laughs> now he told her to use that same sense of humor to convey her message. So, what can you, in the media, do to help? <laughs> like it or not, I have been quite a provider for the media. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> and now I'm asking for your help to reduce the suffering caused by drugs. Diana didn't always agree with Sedlin's technique, but he kept pushing. The results could be striking. Get a little angry now with that. 
I can't be angry and speak like yes, that. Yes, you can. No, yes, it's... you can. I'll show you. Okay, well, you, it'll start to change slightly, won't it? It's going to change. It won't come out quite the same. We must recognise that people are who are HIV positive, and it's for as long as they can. Yet, out of ignorance and fear, they are still being forced to leave their jobs. Smashing. If we continue to believe that AIDS is someone else's problem, we too could so easily be facing the same devastating destruction. Week after week, Diana practiced, watched her tapes, and made visible progress. The more threatened we are, the more what do I mean, we feel. Excuse me, the more changes there are, the more threatened we feel. Right, now carry on like that, yes. Those who become ensnared in addiction are often highly sensitive and creative people. In the past 12 years, the princess was becoming a better speaker. Her former private secretary, Patrick Jeffson, recalls, but he wonders what it really meant for her. She said to me one day, you know, Patrick, I want to make a real Churchillian speech one day. And I thought, well, that's good because, heck, you can't do better than emulate Winston Churchill. But uh, what's she going to say? The thing about Winston Churchill was that he usually knew what he was going to say when he made his big Churchillian speeches. What was she going to say? There were times his methods could be a little strange. <laughs> like the time he told her to pretend to be a prostitute. I said, look, imagine you're a hooker. You've been there, you've done that, and you are fine. So go and strut your stuff. Sounds funny, silly now. But silly? It sounds scandalous. You told her no. to imagine that she's a hooker. It's to imagine you've been at the bottom, and you have come out of the, of the gutter, and you are fine. And if this wasn't national television, I'd use a couple of other words now to, you know, to did say... Did you just use them with her? Yeah. We did all the work, and wow, you came off, and that got you through. The biggest f***ing, you know, nightmare yeah. you've ever been through. And she delivered the speech, and she, you know, she felt very confident. I was, I was sort of in her eye line right down the back. Um, and afterwards, as, uh, as she went back, I walked back, because it was very near Kensington Palace, where she gave it. She went back in the big limo. But she stopped the limo, opened the door, kicked her leg out, and said, not bad for a hooker, eh? And I said, yeah, you did it. And the, her staff were all going, that's all Did you just say hooker? Yeah. The speech exercises, the role-playing, the telling of her life story, all were part of Settlin's effort to prepare Diana for the expanded role she imagined for herself. In one exercise, he coached her in how to do a television interview, for instance. Look at you don't look at the camera. You wander your eyes around a little bit, but you don't go all over the place okay. because we wonder where you're looking. At times, Diana looked more like a harried, multitasking mom than a proper princess at work in her palace. After all, she had two young princes to take care of, and they sometimes interrupted the practice sessions. Oh. If you come in here, you sit down and be quiet. It'll be very quiet. Very quiet. When this tape was recorded, Prince William was 11 and Prince Harry was 9. Don't touch it, William, because it's all focused on me. Your Royal Highness, um, you're currently concentrating very much on your charity work. Would you like to tell us why you feel it's so important to you? i got nothing else to do. <laughs> Recording. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Take two. Occasionally, Harry joined in. So, have you recently met anybody that's actually touched you quite a lot and, and what they're going through? Mm. There, yes, I come across a <laughs> Harry Shush. I come across a great, um, a great deal of people who. Oh, it's so if I can't even string my words together. Well, that's, that's really hard. You've got two of the most impossible people sitting here exactly. with us. Harry, shush, shush. Harry, shush. Harry sit right. down. Good practice to cope Just with sit. <coughs> Just sit. The transformation came together for Diana in the spring of 1993, when, after six months of working with Sadlin, the princess decided to acknowledge in public what people had been reading about in the tabloids for years, her bulimia, and the pain behind it. Ladies and gentlemen, I have it on very good authority that the quest for perfection our society demands can leave the individual gasping for breath at every turn. And there were people around her saying, you know, you shouldn't do this, you stay right away from it. But it empowered her. Eating disorders 
whether it be anorexia or bulimia, show how an individual can turn the nourishment of the body into a painful attack on themselves. It made her feel powerful because she was saying, I know, and I'm fine, and now I'm going to tell all of you what it's like for the other ones. She spoke from the heart. Mm -hmm. With an edge of anger. It's like, read my lips. This is what it's like. Stunned Mm. everyone. Mm. Diana's success was at last making a difference. Her daring new style was bringing her closer to people she wanted to help. It was also taking her away from sterile royal life and into a new independent future. Diana worked with Peter Settlin from September 1992 to December 1993. During that time, her speeches got better, but the press got worse. The headlines about the royals' infidelities seemed to have no limit. Even Peter Settlin got caught up in the craziness. I had lunch with her in a restaurant not very far from here, and the press thought I was the next man. It was after the separation, I was the next man. Excuse me, sir, can you tell me what your relationship is with Princess Diana? And so 30 press were outside my house for three days. And it is terrifying. It's like they've come to pick over you. They come to, well, who is he? Who is he? What's he about? <laughs> and it's horrible. And she said, well, at least you know what it's like now. Then, in November 1993, the Daily Mirror printed infamous photos of Diana working out in a gym in a leotard and bike shorts from rather unprincess-like angles. Diana felt defeated. Here she had spent so many hours working hard to craft a serious public image, and all the media cared about was getting racy pictures. She had had it. When I started my public life 12 years ago, I understood the media might be interested in what I did. In a speech for a charity luncheon in December 1993, she startled the crowd by announcing she was giving up most of the public charity work she cherished. I hope you can find it in your hearts to understand and to give me the time and space that has been lacking in recent years. Diana would eventually go on to champion other causes. She was too bright a light to recede into the shadows. But that so-called time and space speech would be the last one Diana and Peter Settlin worked on together. Mr. Settlin gave Diana many hours of, of, uh, of entertainment in, his, in the way that he taught her to speak. And I think that he succeeded in making her talk in a, in a less affected way. He, uh, I think, made her speak in a more relaxed way. Diana at that time was, was uh, very uh, enthusiastic about gathering advice from all sorts of, of sources. And uh, the result was that people came and went. A lot of people came and went? Quite a lot of people. There were plenty more people in the queue just itching to, to, to get into Kensington Palace and give her the benefit of their advice too. How did she tell you that she did not want to work with you anymore? She didn't tell me. How did it end then? Well, we didn't do any more speeches. The next speech she gave was 15 months later. Paths part and other people move in. I offered up what I had. Uh, I think it helped her. And her world moved on. Suddenly, Diana alone was in charge of her destiny. But by now, the princess had hit her stride. She was confident, prepared, and good at being herself. Yeah, I'm only trying to highlight a problem that's going on all around the world. That's all. Just her very presence could move mountains. Powerful messages delivered with the Diana touch. There's a famous photograph of Diana with a landmine victim on her lap. That changed history, that picture. World leaders within three days changed the law on landmines. And everybody had been trying to do it for years. One picture. 90 journalists had traveled across the planet to be with her to get a picture. And she said, yeah, you can have the picture, but she's in the picture with me, okay? As the world knows too well, the course Diana was charting would end before she figured out where she was headed. It 
was just a few weeks after Diana died, in August of 1997, but the drama over the Sutherland videotapes began. Sutherland had begun to wonder whatever happened to those tapes he'd recorded and left with her years before. He wrote a letter asking palace officials to return the tapes to him. Diana's butler, Paul Burrell, wrote back and told Sutherland the tapes had been destroyed, which might have been the end of it until Sutherland read some intriguing news. It was in the paper that Paul Burrell had uh, a lot of possessions of the royal family in his house. And my wife and I were having dinner. It was uh, her birthday. And I said, I bet you the tapes are there. In fact, they were. Sedlin went to the police, but they were of no help. Nor was the Spencer family, which said the tapes were part of Diana's legacy and claimed ownership. Sedlin decided to sue. A judge ordered that the tapes be returned to him. The Spencers would not comment for this program. Why did you fight so hard to get the tapes back? Because they're mine and they're, they're private. I have a right to have what I did in my possession. And they tried to take that away from me. And that's not fair. We're all equal. Not all the tapes were recovered, however. Diana herself suggests there's more to come at the very end of the interview tape. According to the British media, the missing tapes contain explosive material. The London papers have written that they reveal that Prince Philip once referred to Diana as a mad cow, that Diana fantasized about running off to New York with James Hewitt, and that she had a falling out with each one of her siblings. And there's more. Is any of that true? No, that's not in there. That's not in the tapes, in anything that, that I recorded. You're saying that none of these reports I just reiterated no. to you are true? No. And you're saying that there was an intentional effort to put out information that was well, that, incorrect well, to that, make you look bad. But that also would then justify why they could, I, I shouldn't have them. That they, you know, they're too private and they're too personal and they shouldn't be see, seen by anybody, including me. That I shouldn't ever see them again if I hadn't got them in my possession. But there is another reason the media have been critical of Peter Sedlin. At the time the tapes were being fought over in court, Sedlin's attorney very publicly insisted his client never intended to release them. The fact that you are now talking about these tapes and making mm. them public mm. begs the question, mm. were you lying to the courts through no. your attorney? At that particular time, that is exactly what we would have done. I just want my tapes back. But they wouldn't, I, I was not being aided in any way to get them back. Um, I then had to make a decision as to, do I just let it go and let other people do whatever they want with them, or do I try in some form to take back control of, of that material? What about the fact that Sedlin sold the tapes to NBC News? He says he made the deal so he could pay his lawyer. People have said mm. that the fact that you're releasing these tapes exploits Diana. I can't stop them saying it. I don't necessarily agree. But do you think you exploit no, her? No, I don't. Not Because now. she didn't expect these tapes to be released. She didn't know she was going to die. Um, she didn't know that, that people were going to write what they have about her um, and twist, twist the truth. How much of the money that you've gained from selling these tapes mm. will be for the legal costs of paying to fight for the release of these tapes? A substantial amount will go to that. Some of it will go to, set, to, to look after a child that we adopted from Russia and some of it will go to charities that I care about. So and some of it will help me live because over the last few years what they've done has affected my ability to earn a living. So much about this captivating woman will always remain an untold story. Would she have remarried? How far might she have gone? What other causes would she have championed? What we do know is this. In the time she was here, when she didn't have to, Princess Diana chose to make a difference. Historically, I'm sure she will be remembered as the unhappy victim of a, of a broken royal marriage. But it's even more important that we should remember her as a very strong and effective force for good. What would she want? <laughs> I think on a bad day, Diana would like to be remembered as a victim. But I think on a good day, and most of the days were good days, 
she'd want to be remembered as somebody who was strong, sympathetic, and made a difference. She was just beginning to uh, be quite a dynamic force uh, when she died. People change their lives by stories that they read or they hear about. Well, her story was this woman brought into a situation that uh, disempowered her and made her feel inadequate as a human being in a very public way. And you can actually see her move from that to becoming a powerful woman. Uh, not a girl, but a woman, uh, ready to take on almost anybody. I knew that something profound was coming my way, and I was just um, treading water, waiting for it. I didn't know what it was, I didn't know where it was, but I knew I was different from my friends in where I was going.